the uh, of a hormone oxytocin induces uterine contraction, um, and so went through the um, oxytocin binding to the receptor in the myometrial cells, and then this leads towards uh, a series of different events, um, including uh, influx of calcium and induction of the IP3 pathway. Uh, so I want to talk about calcium and calmodulin. So as calcium loads into the into the cell, we're actually going to have um, an interaction with calmodulin. You remember from previous lectures, calmodulin has four different binding sites for calcium. When we get high enough calcium in the cell, calmodulin is bound by up to three or four calcium ions. And this leads to induction of what's known as the calcium calmodulin um, kinase. So calcium and calmodulin complex activates this kinase. And this calcium and calmodulin activated kinase is going to kinase or phosphorylate other proteins, and one of those proteins is myosin, myosin-like chain kinase. Okay, so we activate myosin-like chain, like chain kinase, and this is referring to a part of the myosin molecule. We have the heavy chain and the light chain, which are subunits on a myosin molecule. You'll remember from hopefully anatomy and physiology or other courses that myosin is a motor protein that can help with cell motility or cell movement. So myosin light chain kinase is actually going to phosphorylate, because it is a kinase, it phosphorylates the myosin molecule. Now, when we have phosphorylated myosin, there shouldn't be D on the end of that, right? We can abbreviate that as just being P myosin, where the P represents the, the phosphate. Phosphorylated myosin now has the ability to interact in this myometrial cell with actin. And this facilitates contraction. Now, this is a little bit different than the way that we can uh, usually talk about muscle cells and contraction because we have sarcomere in um, cardiac muscle tissue and skeletal muscle tissue. We don't actually have sarcomere in the smooth muscle. The smooth muscle is not striated. And so, rather than having that compression of Z line to Z line like we see with those other tissues, we actually are going to have this um, interaction between myosin and actin, where the myosin basically pulls on different threads of actin that are distributed, sort of like a network or a web around the cell. And so as myosin begins to pull on actin, you have the various vectors of movement where the, where the smooth muscle cell basically contracts, contracts in, in several different directions. Now, in order to uh, remove contraction or to stop contraction, the skeletal muscle cells are equipped with an enzyme called the phosphatase. And the phosphatase you can think of as being basically the opposite of kinase. The kinase phosphorylates, the phosphatase on 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 phosphorylates. On phosphorylates or and so it'll actually pull that that phosphate off of the myosin, and then the myosin is inactive or inactivated and no longer can induce contraction of the smooth muscle. Now we also have a second uh, calcium commodulin dependent protein. It's actually uh, dictated as being number two, uh, isoform two. So calcium commodulin dependent protein kinase two. 
This is actually involved in the phosphorylation of myosin light chain kinase, which myosin light chain kinase normally is activated by uh, the calcium hemodulin acti activated kinase. In this case, we phosphorylate the MLKC, which then reduces its ability to produce our phosphorylated myosin. So this second CAM kinase, or calcium hemodulin dependent protein kinase 2, is actually going to uh, is actually going to compete with the other calcium homogenly activated kinase to phosphorylate the, the myosin light chain kinase, which reduces the myosin light chain kinase's ability to produce our phosphorylated myosin. So normally, over here in the figure, you can see once we have oxytocin bind, we have IP3 that gets produced, and we end up loading up the cell from the endoplasmic reticulum and from outside of the cell with calcium. That induces calcium comodulin complexes. We have two that are induced. One that will actually go and lead to myosin um, phosphorylation, which leads to my, uh, myometrial contraction. We have another calcium calmodulin dependent protein kinase that gets turned on as well that actually inhibits myosin light chain kinase and inactivates it or reduces its efficiency, which causes a reduction in uh, P myosin formation and ultimately contraction as well. Okay, so you kind of have these two competing processes, plus you have the phosphatase, which does the action of active myosin light chain kinase. Okay, does that make sense pretty clear there? There is more. Ability. Okay, so um, on the other side of the hypothalamic posterior pituitary interaction, uh, extending from the super optic nucleus, which produce a hormone, goes by a variety of different names. I'm going to use the term vasopressin because. It actually expresses what this particular hormone does in the name. It can also be called antidiuretic hormone or arginine vasopressin. But vasopressin is going to induce contraction and relaxation. And now the question becomes well, what is it going to cause contraction and relaxation? And the answer is certain smooth types of smooth muscle. certain types of smooth muscle. And in particular, vasopressin actually induces contraction of arterial smooth muscle. So contraction of arterial smooth muscle would be known as vasoconstriction. And whenever we constrict the vessel, resistance and pressure are inversely related. And so with vasoconstriction, we are going to have an increase in blood pressure. Okay. It's kind of like putting your finger over the end of the garden hose and water shoots out further. So we're increasing the pressure by reducing the radius of the, uh, the radius of the vessel. So if we apply this specifically to, let's say, the kidneys, actually 
reduce blood flow <clears throat> into the kidney and increase water reabsorption into the blood. Rather than send, <clears throat> excuse me, rather than sending that water into the urine to increase the urinary output. So antidiuretic hormone or arginine vasopressin will cause a decrease in urine production and a decrease in urine output. output. Okay. So how do we control when arginine vasopressin or vasopressin is released? Because again, being produced in the hypothalamus, in the neurons extending from the supraoptic nucleus, is axonally transported in vesicles down to uh, the, the axon and the terminal um, synaptic knobs, and then is released when it's called on or when it's needed. So how do we actually induce that release? And it's going to be related to body fluid osmolarity. So body fluid osmolarity. So when osmolarity decreases, this is going to occur when we have a decrease in solute concentration within whatever so osmolarity is basically this collective description of the water content and the solute content of the solution. So when osmolarity decreases, we're losing solute, so we have a decrease in the concentration or solute concentration of that solution. Now, if I have a decrease in the, in the concentration, the solute concentration, that means I actually have an increase in water. And with that increase in water, I'm going to actually begin to induce... a decrease in the release of arginine vasopressin. Because now I'm going to allow more water to flow out and into the, into, the, into the urine. And then with the converse, if I have an increase in osmolarity, this would indicate an increase in solute concentration, which would indicate, indicate a decrease in water concentration. And then I'm going to have an increase in the release of arginine vasopressin to preserve the water in the bloodstream. Okay. So arginine vasopressin causes a reduction in the production of urine. Right? It's antidiuretic. And so if I need to preserve water, I want to have more arginine vasopressin in the bloodstream. When we need to preserve water, when we have low amounts of water, we have low amounts of water when we have more concentrated solutes in that water, less room for water, because it's taken up by the solutes, the particles, which is higher on that. Okay? So let's talk about a diagram here. Let's draw this out uh, to kind of put a little bit of uh, control in here. All right, so diagrammatically, we basically have neurons. So this is a neuron. I know it looks like a fantastic neuron. That is included or is contained within what's known as a osmoreceptor. So these are a group of cells that will be able to respond and detect changes to the blood osmolarity. So as blood osmolarity changes, those changes are detected by our osmoreceptor cells. And then we have an incorporated neuron that actually feeds back to neurons that are located in the hypothalamus. We also are going to have 
a group of cells with an incorporated neuron that are ferroreceptors. And the ferroreceptor cells are going to continually track blood pressure. So we're continually tracking the chemical makeup of the blood, the solute concentration, or blood osmolarity, and we're continually keeping track of blood pressure. And as osmolarity and blood pressure change, we may trigger a, uh, a reflex loop that leads towards activation of the hypothalamus, leading to the pituitary, uh, in particular, posterior pituitary, inducing ABP secretion if the conditions of osmolarity and blood pressure are present. Blood pressure, yep. So blood pressure is constantly monitored by the baroreceptors, osmolarity constantly monitored by the osmoreceptors. They feed onto the hypothalamus, in uh, particular to the supraoptic nucleus, and then those neurons will be triggered if the conditions are right if we need to preserve water to secrete ABP. So if we need to preserve water, by the way, what would we expect for blood pressure? Blood pressure would be dropping. Osmolarity would be, uh, would be increasing because we would have more solute concentration, less water. Okay, so that's the regulation of arginine vasopressin or vasopressin. Um, and then it has its actions once it's released from the posterior pituitary. It has actions on the kidneys. Okay. So ADP, when we need to preserve water, enters into the kidneys. Now we have to deal a little bit here with some kidney physiology real quick. So this is a structure that you find in the kidneys. It's known as a nephron. Uh, in fact, all of this here is a nephron, and then this structure here is the collecting duct. The nephron is, the, is basically the filter that produces urine, and that urine is deposited after modification through this tubular system into the collecting duct. The collecting duct leads to the urinary, eventually to the urinary bladder. So. I have blood supply that comes in, and I have a capillary bed that feeds through the capillary bed inside of this, what's known as the glomerular capsule, that feeds into the kidney. Now, normally, the urine that's produced, so basically from this capillary bed, we extract plasma, pretty much, the liquid component of blood into the, the, the capsule here, and we begin to have <coughs> urine that flows through um, the, the different segments here of the, of the nephron. This is called the proximal convoluted tubule. I'm going to abbreviate that the PTC. And the filtrate, the urinary filtrate that comes in, normally is about 300 milliosmoles per liter. So proximal convoluted tubule. Okay. So this, this is my blood supply. Let's actually write that down. This is blood, blood supply here. So this is a capillary system. And plasma crosses from the blood into the nephron. And we get about 300 milliosmol per liter um, filtrate in the proximal convoluted tube. This part of the loop here, or of the nephron, this structure here, this kind of hairpin structure is called as the nephron loop or the loop of Henle. And you have a descending limb and an ascending limb. So the top of the kidney would be up here, the bottom or the middle of the kidney would be down over here. So this dip down into the middle of the kidney. Kidneys are very salty. It's a very salty environment. The descending limb is really permeable to water. And so as the urinary filtrate moves down through the descending limb of the loop of Henley, we actually have a whole bunch of water 
that's going to be driven to come out of that urinary filtrate, permeable to water but impermeable to any of the salts that we have in the urine. So I'll think of things like silicon, potassium, chloride, uh, calcium. So those get held in, water rushes out. And so by the time we get down here to the very bottom of the loop of Henle or the nephron loop, we're going to increase our osmolarity a lot. We're going to increase solute concentration. And so down towards the bottom, we're more like 1,400 milliosmoles um, up from 300 milliosmoles when we enter into the proximal convoluted tubule. And then as we come back up through the ascending limb, we're actually on this side permeable to salt, impermeable to water. And so as we come up this side, we end up with things like sodium and other solutes leaving the, um, leaving the, the ascending limb of the loop of Henley. Henley. And so what's pretty interesting here is we actually, on this side, make the tissue more watery. And then on this side, we've set up a concentration gradient that favors the movement on the other side of salt. We move back out and turn the kidney tissue more salty. And so by the time we get up here to this limb, which is called the distal convoluted tubules, so you have proximal and distal convoluted tubules, once we get up on this side, we're actually at about 100 milliosmoles down from 1,400 milliosmoles because we've just lost a whole bunch of salt. And so what enters here into the collecting duct is actually going to be a really, really water, uh, a really water diluted urine. Okay. But what have I done out here in the tissue that surrounds the collecting? I've made it really salty. Okay? So if this is not permeable to movement of water, I'm not gonna, I'm just gonna allow that dilute urine to, to escape. And what color is your urine gonna be? It's gonna basically be clear, right? Because there's a lot of water in it. But what if I make this collecting duct permeable? So that's where arginine vasopressin comes in. Another action of arginine vasopressin or an antidiuretic hormone is for arginine vasopressin to increase a protein known as aquaforins. Okay, so as arginine vasopressin interacts with the cells of the collecting duct, they induce an increase in aquaforins, that's the cell response of the cells of the collecting duct to arginine vasopressin. This actually is going to act through a cyclic AMP second messenger system. So on the um, on the cells of the collecting duct, I have a receptor that the, the arginine vasopressin can bind to. That induces a cyclic AMP second messenger system that results in a cell response of putting aquaporins into the membrane. Okay. So over here where the salt has just moved into the interstitium or the extracellular fluid, that remains in the interstitium of the kidney. And so the kidney is really, really salty. I've never eaten kidney before, but some people have. And I think they eat it because it is salty. And so you get a really salty tissue. You establish that by setting up a concentration gradient on this side of the loop of Henry to induce massive quantities of the sodium and the, um, the other solutes to leave the, the urinary filtrate into the interstitium or the fluid surrounding the cells of the kidney, surrounding the cells of the collecting duct. And when I need to recapture water, I have a high concentration of water over here in the collecting duct. Arginine vasopressin causes insertion of aquaporins into the cells of the collecting duct, and water would actually run out down its concentration gradient from a high amount of water to the lower amount of salt tissue, water, the lower amount of water in the salt tissue. Does that make sense? So you're kind of using this counter current exchange system. There's also a, a blood capillaries in here called the vasorectum that are involved. 
but basically we're using permeability to water. Water rushes down the concentration gradient, creating a favorable movement of sodium in the next step, where sodium dumps out of the out of the urinary filtrate, leaving a whole bunch of water in the urinary filtrate, creating a very salty interstitium inside of the kidney. And then if I have to preserve water, I have a mechanism that I can turn on with arginine vasopressin increasing aquifer and production in the cells to collect and dump, to just dump large quantities of water into the, into the interstitium. So the, there's a question based on only so when we have detection, that, that was the previous figure, when we have a change in blood osmolarity and a change in blood pressure that says, oh, water levels are dropped, we need to preserve water. Aquaporins, or arginine vasopressin release, causing aquaporins to be inserted into the cells of the collecting duct. And I'm actually going to, I'm going to show you uh, an image here of a collecting duct, and we're going to talk a little bit more about how that all happens, basically fill in the gap here on how those aquaporins get inserted into the cells of the collection. We're going to do that now. All right, so cells of the collecting duct. So just to get you kind of set up here on what's going on, this is inside of the tubule of the collecting duct. This is in the lumen of the collecting duct. So this is what we're going to call the urine side. These are the cells of the collecting duct. And then this is the blood side. That would be the kidney interstitium. Um, so there's some place nearby a vessel here, a blood vessel, a capillary. And then you have the interstitium that we've just made salty by this mechanism here, right? Okay, so uh, the collecting duct, arginine vasopressin can bind to a receptor. So we have an arginine vasopressor receptor that is in the cells of the collecting duct. That's what you see happening here. The red star is vasopressin. This green sort of triangle structure is the arginine vasopressor or the antidiuretic receptor. And what you're going to see is it leads to cyclic AMP, which I've already mentioned. So what we know about that receptor is it's a G protein that activates Adenylate cyclase. So it's a G protein that activates adenylate cyclase. And whenever adenylate cyclase is active, it grabs ATP molecules, removes two of the phosphates, and then in the aqueous environment of the cell, that AMP cyclizes and creates the molecule we know as cyclic AMP. Cyclic AMP levels begin to increase in the cell. And we now turn on multiple protein kinase A. This is all stuff that you should be like, yep, 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 I know that, I know that, I know that. So once we get protein kinase A activated, this leads to some downstream changes. Okay, what we have originally called when we were first introducing the idea of hormone uh, mechanisms of action, we called that our cellular response. So the cellular, the specific cellular response here uh, associated with this cyclic AMP second estrogen system in the collecting ducts of the kidney responding to arginine vasopressin. Okay? What happens is we actually have vesicles that contain pre-made aquaporins, and it's specifically isoform 2, so aquaporin 2. Those vesicles translocate out to the urine side of the membrane. Okay, so we're going to call that AQP, that's aquaporin, and again, isoform 2. So you have a series of molecular uh, interactions that occur from PKA to the translocation of aquaporin 2. Translocate to the urine side, we're going to call that the apical. This would be the basal side over here on the blood. So apical side facing the lumen of the collecting duct or just simply the urine side of the membrane. Okay, so I put in aquaporin 2, in aquaporin isoporin 2 into the 
you're inside membrane, what happens to water? Water now rushes into the cell, but that li therein lies a, a little bit of a problem, because if I just allow water to rush into that cell, what's going to happen? That cell will start to swell. So in addition, we actually have a second isoform of the aquaporin <clears throat> protein. It's aquaporin 3 is selectively located into the basal or blood side membrane. Now, once I put aquaporin-3 in, what do I have going on out here in the blood? Does anyone remember in terms of my uh, osmolarity or my solute concentration? Out there in the blood or in the interstitium, I have really high osmolarity, right? So as soon as aquaporin-3 is, in, is inserted, I actually have water that begins to move out of the cell. With aquaporin-2 also put in place, I now create this whole... Uh, this whole pathway for water to go from the urine side through the cell, through aquaporin 2, through aquaporin 3, out into that high osmolarity interstitium, the really salty interstitium of the calcium, which was set up by the nephron and in particular the loop tank. So aquaporin 3 on the basal side, aquaporin 2 on the apical side, those get triggered to be put in by arginine and basal presence interaction with those receptors, we see a cyclical and receptor vascular system. Pretty straightforward. I want to talk about uh, some pathology here really quickly. This is the last thing that we'll talk about in chapter uh, number six. Um, but pathologically, there is a, a form of diabetes called diabetes insipidus. And the way that I sort of remember, so this, the, the diabetes type 1, type 2 is diabetes mellitus. So this is not related to diabetes mellitus. It's not related to gestational diabetes. Those are all three, three uh, all three of those are different pathologies. Diabetes insipidus, the way that I sort of remember what happens here is it kind of looks like onsipidus, like I have to onsipidus my pants all the time because I'm going to urinate a lot. So people who have diabetes um, insipidus, their nephron acts like a siphon. And we continuously siphon off liquid, uh, in particular water, that is never recaptured through the aquaporin mechanisms. Results in constant urination. I'm going to call that constant peeing because I can. Yes, it is. And it's constant deterioration. human may urinate, you know, three, three, four, four, three, four, five times in a 24-hour period, uh, they'll be going, some, in some cases, more than once an hour. This is like, like the other kind of thing, like do they eat? Do they, they do not. But what the word diabetes, do you know what that means? It means sugary urine. Um, and the way that it was named, the guy who, I'm just, I, I guess I, I should say what I've heard, I've never verified this, but it's a good, good enough story that I'm just going to say it's the truth. He had a dog that was diabetic, and he dipped his finger in the urine, he tasted it, it was sugary, and so it, I, think it's, I think it's Greek, and it was dia, which means urine, and Greek, which is related to sugar, so sugary urine. So this individual 
they do produce a lot of urine and they have some other pathology where they incorporate a lot of uh, glucose into the urine as well, so hence diabetes. Um, so, yeah, sometimes referred to as diabetes on zipidus because they do constantly, or they do um, urinate much more frequently than, than a normal physiologic would at the midpoint. So why is that? Well, it turns out that these individuals have a decrease or no arginine vasopressin. So they are missing arginine vasopressin altogether, and so they have a limited or no ability to insert aquaporins. So it can. Yep. So they have no aquaporin insertion, and that means that they have limited or very uh, retarded reabsorption of water because they have so much more water. The thing is, is that the nephrons, there's about a million nephrons in each kidney. And they filter in about an hour, about 150 liters every hour. Now, most of that's recovered, right? And so these individuals are doing the same thing, but they have a limited capacity to be able to recover. And so they end up with an increase in urine production. And so they have to be treated physiologically or pharmacologically. No, they just don't have arginine vasopressin. And so you actually can give them arginine vasopressin analogs that will cause aquaporins to be inserted into the basal and the apical sides of the collecting duct cells. Um, and that can greatly enhance their um, quality of life and their ability to have more, urine, more normal urinary function. Because if you don't treat that at all, they dehydrate very quickly and that will not be survival. Okay. So that's everything I have for chapter six. We're going to move on to chapters five and seven. And the reason I'm handling five and seven together is because we're now looking collectively at the pituitary gland in both of those chapters. And we've actually already talked quite a bit about some of the pituitary physiology. In fact, basically I have dealt with the neural hypothesis, right? The, the posterior pituitary with arginine vasopressin and oxytocin. Um, and so since it's a pretty well connected to the, the hypothalamus. This is just going to basically extend from uh, the, the lecture series that we began here on chapter six. So I'd start a new lecture in your notes. Uh, if you want to call it something, call it pituitary gland. And so now we'll deal a little bit more specifically with the pituitary. We've dealt with some of the actions, some of the hormone release and things like that. I want to take a look at the gland and start off with some um, basic anatomy, and then we'll get into some embryonic development. Okay, so the pituitary gland, the other name is the hypothesis. Yep, it's kind of a combination of five and seven. So chapter five actually deals with what's known as the adrenal hypothesis. Chapter seven deals with the neuro hypothesis. You know, as opposed to the anterior uh, arrow is, is post okay. So the pituitary gland, the other name is the hypothesis. And we've already, we've already seen some of this when we started dealing with uh, the anterior, the, I'm sorry, the hypothalamic anatomy. But the pituitary is divided up into two different divisions. So it, the adenal hypothesis, which is comprised of glandular or epithelial tissue, and so it's sometimes referred to as the epithelial hypothesis. And is also 
also known as the anterior pituitary. The anterior pituitary. Okay, so that's our first division. The second division is the neural hypothesis. The neural hypothesis. Or the posterior pituitary, and this is comprised of this is comprised of the uh, of similar tissue that we find in the hypothalamus and the brain cells, neuronal tissues. Hence the name neural hypothesis. So why did why, why do we have this division? And the answer to that is that these two tissues, even though they're connected in adulthood, they arise from separate embryonic origins. Separate embryonic origins. Okay. And that's where I'd like to begin is with this embryonic development. So here is a picture of different stages of embryogenesis, specifically focused on the development of the tissue that's going to make up the, uh, the pituitary. So you kind of start here, and you move your way through it like this. And so this is the embryo, the whole embryo. Um, you can see where the brain eventually is going to be, begin to develop, and where the dicephalon begins to develop. And we have this region that's known as Rathke's pouch that begins to develop. And it begins to develop up from what's called the, the, stomodium, the, stom the stomodium, which we're going to call the mouth cavity. So eventually it's going to develop into the mouth cavity. So the same type of tissue that develops in the mouth, it begins to, to, to move its way upward in this pouch-like structure known as Rathke's pouch. So that primordial tissue is called the ectoderm, or because it's in the mouth cavity or the oral cavity, we can refer to it as the oral ectoderm. And it begins during embryogenesis to extend upward. And as it begins to extend upward, it's extending from the inside of the stomodium, which is the embryonic mouth cavity. I'm just going to call that eventually where the mouth will be created, known as the Rathke's pouch. Now, because of its origin coming from the ectoderm, the ectoderm is what eventually gives rise to epithelium that coats that opening in the oral cavity. And so it's an epithelial like tissue. So it's basically epithelium that we're, that we're, that we're starting from. Now, we also have some stuff going on here in the diencephalon, which is neuronal. So we have neurological tissue in the diencephalon. And so that tissue from the diencephalon is going to begin to extend down. So I have coming up from the oral cavity, the mouth cavity, this oral ectoderm extending upward, neuronal tissue extending downward from the diencephalon. The tissue extending down from the diencephalon is going to be referred to as the neural hypothesial bud. The neural hypothesial bud. And it is going to be comprised of nervous tissue. So I have two very tissues that are extending in often in, from two opposite locations, the oral cavity and the diencephalon, that are made comprised of two very different tissue types. Now, as embryogenesis continues, so you can see this. Here's the floor of the diencephalon here. Here's the beginning of our neurohypophyseal bud. Here's Rathke's pouch. 
they're converging on each other. Okay. Eventually, Rafke's pouch and the uh, neural hypothesial bud will make contact, and that neural hypothesial bud will begin to form what's known as the infundibulum. So the individual. We will also begin to have a structure known as the stalk of Rafi's pouch. Undergo regression or undergo loss with contact of the oral ectoderm. So we're making this contact, we're still connected here to the oral ectoderm. This is the stalk, right? That piece that's kind of still connected into the oral ectoderm, but is, is progressing up towards the, the neural hypothesial bud, the infundibulum. And then we begin to have regression that, that occurs here during embryogenesis. And so you have kind of these fragments that eventually uh, are going to disappear so that the uh, the adenal hypothesis anterior pituitary is completely removed from the, or should be completely removed from the, um, from the oral ectoderm. So that regression, we have loss of contact, loses contact to the oral ectoderm. Now, as embryogenesis continues, we have a third tissue that begins to develop, and it's actually going to be the bone tissue that's going to develop the cranial floor. So we begin to have this bone development that basically is going to fill in where that stalk was, the regressing stalk of the Rafi's pouch begin to fill bone in there, and bone begins to surround both the um, infundibulum and its progression towards what will eventually be the posterior pituitary, and then the, the formation of the anterior lobe. So the bone begins to develop, and in particular, it's the sphenoid bone that begins to develop around the pituitary, and in particular, there are bone structures, uh, bone fragments that move up and sort of cradle or saddle the uh, pituitary gland, and that's known as the cellish or, or the Turkish saddle. So the bone that develops is the sphenoid. And that bone will close off and divide and now formed anterior lobe from the oral ectoderm. So we close off the area of Rafke's pouch stalk and form cell tercica on the sphenoid bone to cradle or to saddle the pituitary gland. Um, now, occasionally, one thing that, that might happen is you may have incomplete regression of Rafi's stalk, and you leave small fragments. So this is an example here. Small fragments of that pituitary-like tissue in the, uh, in the bone that's, that's kind of developed here. This is called a pharyngeal pituitary. Pharyngeal pituitary. Um, and, and it is abnormal, right? Normally we have complete regression. And you may end up with these pharyngeal pituitary or patches of pituitary-like tissue in the pharyngeal space on both the mouth side of the sphenoid bone and within the sphenoid bone 
and they remain active, similar to the pituitary, but they're dysregulated from the pituitary, and so they may become endocrine tumors, which would just simply be tumors that generate endocrine hormones. And because it's dysregulated, we may have a different uh, expression of these hormones than what we would see under normal physiological circumstances with the um, interaction between the pituitary and the hypothalamus. Okay. So you're probably seeing the word tumor and you're probably thinking cancer. So it, it can, it can become, it can become dysregulated. Um, the, these are these are not malignant tumors. These are benign tumors, and so it's a mass of tissue that can generate those hormones. Uh, and so, yeah, you can have um, Andre the Giant <laughs> acromegaly. Um, that's a, a, a growth on the tumor that begins to generate or put out growth hormone. And so, you get a dysregulation where growth hormone is continually produced. Uh, end up with acromegaly, although a lot of times acromegaly is associated with a tumor that's directly on the pituitary, and it grows and pushes up on the optic nerve, and you end up with some uh, vision stuff. But you can have hormones erroneously produced by that, by that tumor that can cause um, abnormal physiology. So, like, the, like, you could, it, it just all depends. And how active the hormones hormones are being produced. All right, so that's the embryonic development. Now here's what the pituitary looks like in adults. And so you end up with the two divisions, the posterior and then the uh, in the anterior, I should say, in the posterior. And then you have this, this stalk um, that descends down from the hypothalamus. So, um, starting out, <coughs> sorry. <coughs> starting out with the adenal hypothesis. The adenal hy hypothesis, or anterior pituitary, uh, it's going to be divided up in adults into two different parts, and then we're going to see a third part at, at certain times during, during the life cycle. So the first part is known as the pars distalis, which is this anterior lobe. And it's distalis because it's further away from the, the connection. Then we're going to have a structure that's known as the pars tuberalis. And the pars tuberalis is this structure that creates or forms uh, around the infundibulum. So it's sort of like a tube around the infundibulum. And the infundibulum is inside, which is actually neurohypophyseal in nature. And then the third part, which shows up uh, in infants and is lost in adults, in humans, but it's present in some other mammals in the adult is known as the pars intermedia. The pars intermedia. And the pars intermedia is this, this part of the pituitary that sort of is in between the low, the, the two lobes, the anterior and posterior lobes. So this pars intermedia is present in infants, in humans, then it's lost in adulthood. But in other mammals, it's present in other mammals, even in adulthood. Now, technically, the term that we're using here called the anterior lobe is really a combination of 
of pars distalis and pars tuberalis. Pars distalis and pars tuberalis. And when the pars intermediate is present, whether it's in infants and humans or other mammals, that's known as the intermediate the intermediate lobe. Okay. So anatomically, those are the structures that we have that make up the anterior pituitary. The posterior side, which is the neural hypothesis, of the pars nervosa, which just simply means basically the nervous tissue part, and then the infundibulum. Pars nervosa and infundibulum. Now, what we refer to as being the posterior lobe is technically comprised of pars nervosa. And then we would refer to the stalks extending down from the, um, from the hypothalamus, just simply the, the infundibula. Now, for the organisms where we have the pars intermediate uh, present, the, the combination of pars and, uh, I'm sorry, the posterior, pars nervosa, the posterior and the intermediate lobes will sometimes be referred to as the neuro intermediate lobe. For those organisms, they don't just have a posterior lobe, they have a neural. Alright, so let's talk about the uh, blood circulation. And we'll start out with the pituitary circulation. Um, on the on the anterior side. So interacting with the pituitary, we have two capillary circuits that are present. The anterior pituitary is going to have a, a sort of interesting. Um, it, touched on this already, but sort of an interesting makeup. The other capillary that I'm talking about here, capillary circuit, is the, the one that interacts with the posterior, uh, posterior lobe. Okay. So I want to start out with the, the first capillary circuit being the anterior pituitary circuit. <clears throat> so this side is the anterior, and we have a capillary bed that interacts with the hypothalamic tissue, and then a capillary bed that interacts with the pituitary tissue, and we have these veins or venules that go in between those two capillary beds. So this anterior circuit is known as a hypothalamic hypothesial system. We have the hypothalamic hypothesial portal system, and that's the description of the first capillary bed. Now, leading into the pituitary from the general circuit is what's called the superior hypothesial artery. So the superior hypothesial artery is what leads in, and this leads into this 
capillary bed that's associated with the hypothalamic tissue. So superior hypophyseal artery delivers the blood from the general circuit. And it connects into one of the two capillary beds we have in the hypothalamic hypophyseal portal system. It connects to a capillary bed. This particular capillary bed is going to be the superior capillary uh, superior capillary bed, and it's typically referred to as the primary plexus. So here is our superior hypophyseal artery. This is the primary plexus. Sometimes in right here it's referred to as the primary plexus of the hypothalamal hypophyseal portal system. So that's our primary plexus or our superior capillary bed. And you'll see that it's located around the structure known as the median eminence. Now, if we go back to the neuro uh, or to the hypothalamic systems, this particular capillary bed is what interacts directly with the parvocellular neurosecretory neurons. So it specifically interacts with the neurons that extend down from the hypothalamus that are referred to as the parvocellular neurosecretory system. So this is our main parvo, parvocellular. So this is our main interaction between the hypothalamic neurons and the anterior pituitary. Now, this primary plexus has two, typically, two vessels that lead from the primary plexus to the secondary plexus. Those two vessels are technically venules, smaller veins, and are going to be referred to either as the intervening venules or sometimes referred to as the hypophyseal portal veins. Hypophyseal portal veins. The capillaries associated with the median eminence in our primary plexus, they converge down and create these, these veins. Which this is pretty pretty strange because normally you go from arteries to capillaries to veins and back to the general circuit. In this case, we're going from artery to capillary to veins back to a capillary bed. And then back to the veins, you know, uh, leading out to the general circuit. The purpose of these intervening venules or these hypophyseal portal veins is to connect to a secondary bed of capillaries. And the secondary bed of capillaries is the inferior capillary bed. And it's referred to as the secondary plexus. And that term, by the way, plexus, is just referring to basically that network-like structure, kind of like a spider web. So it's inferior, it's a secondary plexus, and it's associated or located within the anterior pituitary.
So that secondary plexus of the hypothalamic hypothesial portal system drains into the anterior hypothesial vein and also to the hypothesial vein. All right, so two different um, two different veins that lead away from this capillary bed. We have two vessels, the anterior hypothesial vein and then the hypothesial vein that leak back from the secondary plexus into the general circulation. This will be the main route for anterior pituitary hormones to be delivered to the rest of the organism. On the posterior pituitary side, we have um, so a artery that leads in. This is called the inferior hypothesial artery that brings blood in from the general circuit. Inferior hypothesial artery. circuit. It connects up to really a third capillary bed. We've already talked to two of them, right? So this connects to another capillary bed. And this capillary bed is located within the tissue of the posterior pituitary. This capillary bed that we have neurons from the SON and from the PBN that extend out and interact with this capillary bed. So this particular capillary, capillary bed interacts with the magnocellular neurosecretory system. Cellular, which we've already talked about, parvocellular and the pancrocellular neurons um, as part of the hypo, uh, hypothalamus, hypothalamic lectures. All right, I'm only going to put down two more notes for you today. Sort of is reviewing. You may not just. Okay. 
catching on just yet. All of this stuff we've already been introduced to, with the exception of a few items. So the the uh, inferior hypo, uh, hypophyseal artery leads into the capillary bed, the posterior pituitary capillary bed that drains to the hypophyseal veins. So we got these veins here, the hypophyseal veins. And these are going to drain capillary bed and any hormones that are distributed into that capillary bed to the general circuit. So just to take you through this really quick, okay? On this side, this is the portal system. You have a primary plexus that's associated with basically the hypothalamus. Leading into that is the blood supply from the uh, anterior, uh, I'm sorry, superior hypophyseal artery, okay? Then you have these intervening venules that lead to the secondary plexus or the secondary capillary bed and it drains from the anterior pituitary through the anterior hypophyseal vein and the hypophyseal vein. This part of the capillary system associated with the hypothalamus is what interacts with the parvocellular neurosecretory cells. Those are the neurons that release our six releasing and inhibiting hypothalamic hormones. Down here, you just have another capillary bed associated specifically with the posterior tissue. Blood comes in from the inferior hypophyseal artery because it's it's coming up from, from the inferior uh, inferior portions of the of the body. And then you drain through these hypophyseal veins. Okay? So this particular capillary bed, superoptic nucleus, paraventricular nucleus, neurons run down and interact with these capillaries. They synapse with those capillaries. And those are the magnocellular neurosecretory neurons. Okay? So get to know that anatomy there so that you kind of can um, have an idea of when we produce a hormone in the hypothalamus, how it travels to the pituitary to cause uh, another hormone to be released. That's all I got.